Thank you, everyone. And as Linda pointed out, I do have a mixed history. I've worked on knowledge representation and reasoning uh, and ontologies for a while. And, um, and now I am working on um, the problem of how do we get code to behave like knowledge graphs? So you should be seeing my next slide, which is the outline. Please let me know if it's working. No, we are on the first one. Okay, so this is the issue with the... All right, do you see it now? Yes. Okay, so I'm gonna stay with this format because I, I think there's some issues about Zoom and how it works when, <laughs> when you use full screen uh, play slideshow mode. Um, so what uh, I want to do is describe why we try to build knowledge graphs for code. Uh, the formalisms that we use are primarily just graphs and RDF. And in particular, we have heavy use of Sparkle behind the scenes, uh, primarily because uh, code and questions about code that you ask tend to have uh, transitivity built into it. Um, so that's sort of my overview of how we approach the topic. So let me just start with the first question of why build knowledge graphs for code? So there's an increased interest in building AI algorithms for code. Um, that, you know, this is a, a website called ML for Code and it keeps track of all the papers that have come out in the space of AI for code. So that includes use of AI algorithms to do things like code generation, code search, et cetera. And as you can see, the, uh, the interest in this space is just growing quite a bit since say, I would say 2016. And if you look at what is going on in this space of AI algorithms, um, there are lots and lots of neural models that are being built so that we can do better code search, code detection, code refactoring, bug detection, security analysis, and so on. And most of the approaches are very deep learning based. And I think this community understands that deep learning is useful, but it also has certain limitations. So for example, let's just take a, a, a few examples of the sorts of deep learning models that have come up for uh, code. And you see things like these, what's so-called language models for code. And the core idea behind these language models is people feed them the tokens of the program and they feed them millions of programs in the spirit of large scale language models. So you get things like, okay, so, you know, this is a piece of code where DF equals um, some read CSV of uh, foo, and this is a Python program. And as you can see, what they do is they tokenize the uh, uh, tokens and they feed it to a language model and they force the language model to predict something, which is called a mask. In this particular case, the mask would have to be pandas, right? That's what they'd have to produce. Um, the model would have to produce. Now, the models really vary uh, tremendously in terms of sort of what is the scope of the program that they give. So they give like either line by line or functions because there's always in deep learning models a severe restriction on the length of the input. So you do have to decide to either keep it within a small window of the actual program, and that window can be either a line or a function. And also there's a decision that gets made on sort of what type of tokens to feed these models. Some of the models are really cross language. So things like transcoder, for example, <clears throat> are built across Python and Java and all other programming languages and others are much more language specific. So when you have language specific programs, you could use language specific tokens, which you know a system that a compiler might use, for example. But when you use um, cross language uh, training, then obviously you're not as sensitive to 
um, things like that. So they end up using natural language tokens, which is less than ideal because programs are not natural language. And finally, you can have different kinds of objectives in the language models. So you could have things like masked language models that are like the ones I showed you here. You could also have replace tokens and the system has to sort of predict which token to replace. So it really does change up a little bit what the different objectives are. The key point though, is that all of these particular language models, DL, deep learning language models, they treat code as though it is natural language and they apply the same techniques that people have used for natural language to code. But code is somewhat unique in terms of, com you know, compared to human natural languages. So first of all, it's abstract. So, you know, for example, I could rename all the variables in the program and it still has the same semantic. That is not true of natural language. You could rename variables and it would have a different semantic. It's also very non-local. So program flows actually flows through many different lines of code and even across different files. And the use of very local sort of techniques to use natural language tokens in a single program really limits what you can learn about the semantics of code. So um, what ends up happening, I believe, is that given all these sorts of constraints, the models learn very, very local properties of code and nothing about things like program scope, and it really does tend to sort of limit itself to very, very short term, short uh, spans, you know, very local spans is what they can at most learn. So the question we started with when we started this project was we said, well, can we actually teach the system, the semantics of code? And in particular, can we borrow an idea from the semantic web community, which has built extensive knowledge graphs for um, human knowledge from things like Wikipedia, DBpedia, Wikidata, et cetera. And can we start to think about building knowledge graphs for code? And what would that mean? You know, what, what, what would a knowledge graph for code really contain? So that is, you know, what we started with. It's an ambitious approach. And we started with the language of Python for reasons that will become uh, clearer as I approach the application space, primarily because, um, you know, we were very, very interested in seeing if we could use knowledge graphs for code in the space of AI and uh, data science. So how can we actually automate AI itself, the algorithms that we choose based on um, this sort of knowledge graphs for code? So that's sort of the driving um, decision as to why we, we went with Python. So how do we understand human, uh, how do we as humans understand code semantics? So here's a bit of Python code on the left. I apologize if this is not something you're very familiar with, but I'm using it as a running example also because we try very hard in this, in this work to use it in the space of data science. And those are the examples I'll be showing you later as well. So if you look in the left, uh, basically what is going on is, um, this, is a, this code is trying to build some sort of machine learning model for some data set. Uh, my DF is the data set in question, and the code begins by splitting the code into a drain and test split, which is sort of standard in you build an AI model or a machine learning model. And then it says, okay, you know, for all these different types of SVC, which happens to be a, a machine learning algorithm, uh, please go ahead and run fit and build three different models for the three different types of um, algorithms that are under consideration. A key point that I want to make is if in the data science world, as you all probably know, uh, you have to, it's a very large space uh, of models that might be appropriate. And for any given data set, the model might be different. So the search for a given data, uh, for a different, uh, for a given um, algorithm, 
for a given data set uh, is an important problem that data scientists are often uh, wrestling with. So they actually have to try multiple AI algorithms to come and settle down on the correct model. By the way, if you have questions anytime during the talk, please feel free to interrupt me. So um, on the right is a representation of what we think a knowledge graph might want to look like for this code. So the first thing is we want to abstract away things like variable names. Who cares if someone called it train or test? Uh, someone else might call it like X or Y. Another person might call it foo. So you, know, you really don't care about variable names. What is really crucial in this bit of code that you want to capture is that someone is calling an API library on this thing called sklearn and it's doing something called a train test split, right? And that in turn is returning a tuple of arrays. We don't care about the names of what people call those, whether it's train test or anything else. But interestingly, that is flowing into a machine learning al algorithms fit method called svc.fit. Now, if you look purely at the program and you knew nothing at all about these libraries, even as humans, we wouldn't know what was going on. As humans, we go and say, oh, what's the documentation? What does this, what this method do? What does this class do? And we also might look heavily at um, Stack Overflow posts. We might say, what's the difference between this SVC thing and you know, why is it linear and why isn't it like RBF? What's the difference? So fundamentally, our thought was that we want to end up with a knowledge graph representation that captures the graph of how program objects flow within the program and connect it to connect the actual function calls to the appropriate documentation and to Stack Overflow posts. Right? So that was the goal of the project. Now, how do we do it? So if we go back to how one might try to construct a graph, um, you first have to ask the question of, should we actually be trying to run the program to understand the flow of objects within the program? Um, dynamic analysis of programs, which achieves this, does it by tracing the program. So basically every program has to have a trace and you have to try to figure out you know, what functions were called and how and what objects were manipulated. And certainly that is one way to go. Another way to go, which is the approach we took, uh, is using static analysis of programs to find the exact same graph that I was talking about earlier. So basically the core idea in static analysis is to simulate the running of a program. It isn't precise. It's not gonna be 100% precise because if there's some bit of code that does a for loop and it says, you know, for i equals zero through some variable name and you pass in an argument to the program that defines what that variable is, we wouldn't know anything about that variable. But we can actually try to simulate and understand the flow within the program and here's an example of such a simulation. So you have this, you know, in our, in our work, we actually targeted a million GitHub Python scripts to show that this is feasible to generate a graph, a set of graphs across all of these different programs. And then you can look at the lines of code. So there's this read CSV call, the data that comes back from that, which is the object that is returned by it, then gets called uh, with the where um, method. And then the where method then gets called, uh, you know, is, get, is sent into the train test split. And the train test split then is read in a slice. So all of this information we generate by static analysis. And we generate a graph that shows exactly what is going on in the program in terms of the objects that get created and how they get passed to each other as arguments or as a receiver where the same object is being used to make another method call. Okay, so that's one aspect of the graph that we develop 
this is the knowledge graph that we're developing, kind of like uh, you can think of this as wiki data for code, right? That's the analogy. Now, there are substantial challenges for static analysis. Um, we actually use a more, uh, an open source library that one of my co-authors developed called Walla. And Walla uses, um, is, is been around for, uh, I don't know, 15 years or so, but we, it, we definitely enhanced it significantly to handle Python and to also handle the fact that we can analyze a vast number of programs using some sort of abstraction for library calls and field accesses. So, you know, the efficiency aspect of this was definitely something that we added when we built this um, graph. Um, I'm going to skip this because I've already discussed this particular topic. So let's go to the next slide over here. Now we want to try and get documentation and our class hierarchies for each of the calls in the code. It's not always possible to get each of the calls documentation, but we can try to identify for a corpus, the, large, the top libraries that have been used and then try to dynamically install the module. This is very much a, a use of something like reflection in Java. You know, Python has a similar mechanism. And so you install the module, inspect it, and you gather up all the documentation that you can for the classes and functions that are in the module. And a module is like a, a large library. So pandas is a module and you can get all of the associated documentation associated with the library. And then we use information retrieval techniques. So we build up a giant text index and we use information retrieval techniques on the class names to infer the connections between the class, uh, the classes mentioned in the return and parameter types to the actual classes, right? So if something says, oh yeah, this returns a data frame, like in a pandas read CSV, the the documentation says I'm returning a data frame. We still need to qualify it into a pandas date frame object. So we try to use information retrieval techniques to figure out exactly what that particular uh, return value might be. And then finally, we also connected um, code and different bits of this graph that we just talked about also to the Stack Overflow post. So if a particular post is mentioning something like an SVC or an SVC classifier, we would find all the posts that mention that and then link it in to the graph. So our graph, our, our Wikidata style graph for code is really a combination of three main uh, inputs. One is the analysis of the code, which gives you sort of a structure of what's happening in the program. Then we have the documentation, and then we also have uh, forum posts. So here's some statistics about these 1 million uh, programs that we analyze. This is primarily just as a way to understand that the system scales, that you can actually connect up all these different components. So we have, for example, you know, uh, 5.8 million classes and 257,000 methods and uh, similar amounts of functions in this graph. And we also have connected up the web forums. So about 88,000 web forums were connected to this much more methods and so on. So this now allows us to do some interesting things. And this is when I'm gonna skip over to the applications of what we might do with this uh, kind of information and this kind of knowledge graph. So I, um, a little bit of background um, in this space. Uh, one of the key things that companies like IBM and Google and Microsoft and um, uh, you know, other companies like H2O are very, very interested in is how do we take um, data scientists, and we know that there's a huge real demand for data science in the, in the real world. How do we take these data scientists and help them with the task of, of automating data science? So a big part of this field is called AutoML, 
is autom automatic machine learning. And the whole goal of that automated machine learning is to be able to take a new data set and suggest to the human all kinds of information that might be useful in generating the data set. At the extreme, you take the data set and you explore different AI algorithms automatically. And you also explore what kinds of parameter settings you need to use for those algorithms. So it's a very, um, you know, you can think of this space as a very large space because once you include not just the AI algorithm, but all of the hyperparameters that might have to be manipulated in it, uh, we're talking about a very large space. And most of these systems take a really long time to come up with the solution. Still, it helps the user because their, their job is to explore all the space on their own, and that is extremely tedious. So one of the questions we asked, um, having created this graph for code is, how can we use this sort of graph for this sort of problem? And before I do that, I would have to explain a little bit about what is called in the programming languages community type inference for languages like Python. And I'll explain the problem and why we need type inference, but you can think of it as a way to augment the knowledge graph that we built for code with information about the types of systems or types of um, uh, uh, return types and parameter types of functions in the graph. And let me try to see if I can motivate it for you. So why is type inference important? Uh, let's take the same problem of trying to understand what is expressed in data science code. And as I said, this is a very important problem because there's a lot of uh, products in the real world that are targeting this problem. So you might want to say, okay, I, you know, I'm a data scientist. I just created this pandas data frame, which is simply a table. You know, it's just like a database table. Think of it that way. So data frame is nothing other than a table. But you know, something gets done to this data uh, table once it's read into the code. What kinds of algorithms are being used on it? So what kinds of transformers and estimators and so on actually have use this particular data and how do they do it? Like, what are they manipulating in the data, right? So those are the important questions from the perspective of, um, of this uh, problem. So as I said to you earlier, you know, you have this sort of uh, graph, but unfortunately we actually don't, because Python is, a, in a, is an extremely dynamic language, we actually don't know that what is going on when you call a read CSV uh, call is that it returns a data set, right? We don't know that. And similarly, when you say uh, train test split, uh, we don't know that the type of the thing that it's taking is actually a data, is a data set. It's not clear at all in a dynamic language like Python, what the types are of these different things. So my DF could be anything. We don't actually know that. So, um, you know, what we need is actually type inference so that you can do much better understanding of what is happening inside the data frame code, the data science code. So for example, here's a, a partial graph on the left, which says, you know, I just read a CSV file. Okay, I, learned, I, know, I need to know that it returned a data frame. When I finish reading the data frame and I sent it to train test split, I need to know that it returned two arrays and so on and so forth. This allows us to do all kinds of really cool reasoning tasks on top of the, the graph. So an example would be, let's say um, I'm interested in learning what kinds of columns are being manipulated in the data science code. Right now, the only way I would know that is saying, well, any access of any field of a data frame object is likely to be a column name because you know people refer to column names in the table by string values, and they can use a, you know an accessor method to get that. So if I look at the accessor method and I look at the string constant that is in the parameter, then I know it's probably a column name. 
But for that, I need to know that it's a data frame object. I can't just take any object in the program and ask it for any string constant, and I will end up with the wrong set of columns if I did that. So I really do need to ensure that what I'm looking at is in fact a data frame object. Similarly, you know, I might be interested in seeing what are people doing with data and you know, let me see if they're trying to, for example, create formulas from the data. You know, an example would be they might take like three columns and compute a third, fourth column from here. This is actually a real example from COVID data sets. And how do we get that? Again, we need to know that they're manipulating a data frame object and they're creating new columns in the data frame object. The code has that implicitly, but we need to understand what the types are in order to get to that. So the first step we did actually was try to use this graph for type inference. So as I said to you, you know, type inference in, in dynamic languages like Python and JavaScript even are very, very tricky because it's really difficult to, uh, to infer that. Um, so here's an example of different kinds of things or different kinds of patterns in the graph that might end up actually returning a pandas data frame. You have things like pandas.readcsv followed by a drop call or a drop na call or a drop call and an add call. All of these actually are returning pandas.data frames. But when you're summarizing a, a Python pipeline, you have no idea of that. So you would actually just look at the call stack, which is shown here on the left. You know, you have this pandas.readcsv, which then leads to a drop call, or pandas.readcsv, which leads to a drop na call. And they look different, right? They don't look the same. And you don't know that in fact, what's being manipulated at the same time is just a data frame object. So let's step back a moment. And I wanna show you what Python type inference looks like in standard tools today. Um, if you look at the distribution of tools from this tool called PyType, which is a static type checking tool for Python, uh, there is a dominance of any or none in the types. And basically any means the system had no idea. It's like object in Java. It's saying, I have no idea. I don't know what this is. And so you, you get to a situation where you're talking about something like 70 plus percent of um, the cases where the system basically says, I have no idea, right? Between none and any, we have a very large number of pro, um, functions which these systems simply cannot use. So the first question we asked is, can we actually take our own code graph and, and augment our graph so that we can do better type inference? And what we did is, what, you know, in, in the PL community, there's a well-known technique called duct typing, uh, which is, duct typing within a program. Um, if you, if it basically the idea is that if it looks like a duck and quacks like a duck, then it must be a duck, right? So if you are in a piece of code and you've used an object in a way that it has the same method calls as a particular class, then you could probably infer that it's that class. So what we did actually was we described, um, we basically, um, did this uh, piece of work where we took the different programs and we tried to understand across different programs what kinds of methods are being called on the same sort of object. Um, so you have the standards or read CSV call, you have this TZ convert call, and you have drop and drop NA all sort of following the same structure in the call stack. And when you look in the class definitions that we have in our graph, because we do have this knowledge graph now, we can say, oh yeah, this particular class is probably a good candidate because you know, it's got most of the methods that, uh, that uh, follow the read CSV call. So like that, we basically did type inference from the analysis code. And then we also did type inference from doc strings. And when we're doing type inference from doc strings, um, we, I think as I told you earlier, we basically use IR techniques to determine what are the possible parameters and return types of functions. So we have this text index, and when we look at returns, data frame or text parser, 
we, are, we go ahead and try to um, do entity resolution on data frame. And then we learn that it probably is pandas.data frame. And that's how we figure out that that's possibly the type that we have. So let's take a look at these mine pipelines and type, type inference from those pipelines. Uh, we have a total, um, totally we did inferences on about 22,000 methods from talk strings and about 23,000 methods from duct typing from the analysis. And if you look at the distribution of types now, um, you know, the, the um, the dominance is actually of user defined types. So that blue actually is misleading. It's actually classes. It's different user defined classes that we find. So 75% of the types we detect are actually user defined types and about 17% are primitives. Um, and we also use about 8% built-ins by which I mean dictionaries or this data structures that are just part of the library. So we also then tried to validate this type inference and we created a gold standard based on dynamic type inference. So we actually ran the programs using their unit tests and figured out exactly what the actual return type was. And as you can see here, um, we're not you know, at fantastic scores. Uh, so our precision and recall and F scores are in the 58, 51 to 58% range. Uh, not percent, 51 to 58 for F scores. And for pi type, it's at six. So, you know, compared to the standard approach to doing static type inference, this knowledge graph and inferring over the knowledge graph that we're doing is actually not so bad, right? It's not, there's obviously huge room for improvement, but it's not that bad. Uh, we also did uh, sort of manual checks and uh, the precision was 43% for the analysis and 77% for doc strings. And we also looked to see if we could figure out from class constructors what the right type was. And there we actually got it at 97%. Uh, so there are just different techniques to try to validate the type inference. And we have, as I said, not great results, but then if you compare it to what is already out there in terms of static typing, uh, we're doing a lot better in terms of the graph. Okay, so now this is great. Now that we have a notion of these types, we can look at the sorts of problems I talked about earlier, which was to say, okay, can we take these, these code, this like huge database of programs and learn something useful from them? you know, learn it for some sort of task that we are interested in. So back to the problem of auto ML, which is automatic machine learning. Uh, the, in this particular bit of work, what we tried to do was we said, okay, let's take existing systems like Flamel and auto Escalon. They're both systems that are open source and that they do, um, you know, explore a set of um, algorithms Often it's called a pipeline because there's like a bunch of algorithms strung together, right, into a, a sort of a pipeline. So let's take those and let's see if we can enhance them so that we can do much better with the extracted code that we have. So um, in many of these systems, things like AutoGalon, for example, they actually use a database of data sets. So they have like hundreds of data sets that they've already run their code on. This, they've already run this auto ML search on. So they have searched for all kinds of possible pipelines, all kinds of possible parameters. And what they do when they see a new unseen data set is they say, okay, what is the data set that comes closest to this one? So they have something called a metadata for the data set, you know, they, they sort of say, how many classes are being predicted? Is this a multi-class problem? Is this a regression problem? Um, what are the numerical uh, attributes of those data sets? How, what is its queue, et cetera? So they have a bunch of different metadata attributes for a given data set. And then they get a new data set. They say, okay, 
what is the closest data set to this one in terms of its metadata features? And if I can find one in my database, then I'll start with that particular uh, pipeline and then they get smarter after that. So this is like the cold start problem. You know, so like, where do we start the search? Well, we start the search at some interesting point that we know from previous experience, from previous data sets, that that might be a good place to start. So our question actually was, well, can we use the extracted graphs that we have, the knowledge graphs for code, and their associated data sets instead of like this dynamic database? So what we did was we took about a hundred data sets and their corresponding programs. So we have about 2000 pro programs that are associated with these hundred data sets. We created a knowledge graph for code exactly the way I just described here. We did type inference. So we understand that something has got a data set, something is a, you know, uh, an array that is returned from a string test split and so on. And then we understood sort of what the pipeline was that was being used. So going from the actual code to the pipeline is, a, is an abstraction step that we had to do because the actual code would be in terms of, oh yeah, I actually wanted to visualize this data. I want to see what it looks like. And then eventually I will like, you know, compute some descriptive statistics on it. And eventually I'm gonna send it to the AI algorithm. In our case, really, we don't care about all the visualization and the exploration of the data because really what we're trying to do is feed this right into an auto ML system. So we had to basically take uh, the data frame and then try to uh, use Sparkle to compute the uh, data flow to key estimators and transformers um, using basically transitive path queries. And so once we have that sort of level of abstraction for each of the different pipelines, we then fed to um, Flamel and Auto SK Learn the same pipelines. So the idea is what if we took those and we fed to Flamel and Auto SK Learn, each of these systems has a way in which you can say, you a user can say, I really want to start my search here. So that is really what we're doing. We're saying, I want to really start my search here to, to each of these systems. So we compare, we compare two cases. We compare the case where they were running their own algorithms with their own databases. And um, we compared them to a case where we said, no, 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 you need to start from this point in the search space where the, this point came from the knowledge graph. It didn't come from their own algorithm. We used about 77 data sets for testing. And we had a group of things that were like classification data sets, multi-class classification data sets, and regression data sets. And I'm gonna show you some of the results. Um, a lot of the work I'm describing here is fairly uh, new. So it's unlikely you would find it out there in the web, but if you're interested, this one is on archives, so you can try to find it. It's uh, or ping me if you're interested. Um, so what, uh, what we are showing here in these different graphs is the blue line is flannel, the uh, green line is auto escalon, and the knowledge graph infused pipelines that we call KG pip auto escalon and KG pip flannel are the cases where we take the knowledge graph of code and we basically inject the starting point for the auto ML algorithm using uh, the, the graph. Um, what you can see actually is these are these uh, flare graphs. So if something is like uh, dropping to the middle there, it means the performance was poor on that system. So the uh, further away you are uh, from the center, the better your performance, right? And in most of the cases, um, we performed at least as good as auto escalon and we definitely outperformed Flamel. So um, these are very interesting results. It shows that actually you can take knowledge graphs of code and you can actually inject it into um, 
the, these auto ML sort of algorithms to try to improve them. And this is very similar, I think, in spirit to how people have used things like Wikidata in machine learning and, uh, and AI algorithms. You take a very declarative system, a declarative representation of, the, the, uh, of um, either programs or you know, knowledge about the world, and you try to enhance machine learning algorithms with it. So we're very interested and we find these results really intriguing. Um, and we have some interesting challenges ahead for future work. Uh, we would actually like to see how far we can push these knowledge graphs for code for all kinds of applications around code. I mean, um, the, um, you know, we, we would like to, for example, see if we can push it for code search, uh, for code refactoring, code rec recommendation to, to suggest the next line of code, and so on. So these are all sort of interesting avenues for future work in terms of using these different sorts of knowledge bases. Um, I think I went a little too fast and I'm done, but I wanted to point to uh, some details. If you want to, if you're interested in this line of work, uh, we have a, a, a GitHub IO project. We have open source the, the the techniques to build your own knowledge graphs for programs. And because we realized that, you know, the programs, the 1 million programs we chose in graph for code when we built it uh, is not necessarily what might be interesting to you in your own application. And so we would like, to, like for the, for the data science code, we actually analyzed a different data set because we were focused on data science code, not just general, general Python code. And so we, we open sourced the library to do this. Um, there's a KCAP paper uh, coming out this year on the, the, um, on the kit to develop these uh, knowledge graphs. And um, I think that's also mentioned in the uh, GitHub bio page. So if you have any um, questions, I'd be happy to take them. And uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm interested to hear your feedback.